Hello everybody, my name's Eric, and welcome back to a brand new interview. Today, we have, I would say, practically a legend within the entire series. You'll see what I mean here in a minute. So today, we have Stephen Stanton with us. And, why don't you introduce yourself, sir? How are you doing? I'm doing great, Eric. Thanks for uh, having me on. And um, I'm guessing that most of your audience, uh, considering that they're into Bioshock, would be familiar with a character that I've done on the series uh, known as Mr. Bubbles or uh, the Big Daddy. So how does one essentially go about playing this part? This is something I've been curious about ever since getting into the series and hearing all of these like different noises kind of mesh together. Like, how is that for you on a recording side? Do they just have you do like random stuff or what was that like? Yeah, it was real interesting. Um, you know, at that point in time, which was like around, uh, actually it was March of 2006 that I actually did the first audition for this character. Um, I'd been doing a lot of other um, games up to that point. I was on things like EverQuest and Tales of Symphonia, Bard's Tale, Lord of the Rings. I'd done, uh, been doing uh, Ben Kenobi for Lucasfilm and the Star Wars, like Battlefront Two and Empire at War, you know, and... Uh, so there was, you know, I've been doing a lot of games. There was a lot of games being produced at that time. And a lot of them were kind of like, you know, you're doing things like orcs or warriors, you know, and, you know, different kinds of battle uh, focused games. So it was always interesting when you had something that came along that was different. One of those games along those lines was uh, something that I did uh, for a company called Double Fine. It was uh, Tim Schafer's uh, Psychonauts. I don't know if you're familiar with the game. Yes, sir. I played a character uh, uh, called Social Nine. He was uh, kind of a, a mentor to the main character, Raz, in that game. And one of the things that struck me about that was how different it was from everything else that was being produced at the time. You know, we worked for like, like for about two years on that game. But it was so different when we were recording it, um, you know, when we're doing when they're doing recording sessions for for games uh usually the actors are in there by themselves because you have reams and reams of material that you're trying to record based on all the different decisions and actions that the player is making so it's not a linear storyline that you're recording so you know it takes a long time to do this and then there's rewrites and then something like for instance psychonauts was like they're trying to it makes sense when you see the game but when somebody is there trying to explain to you like okay so you're going inside sasha mine's mind and a tiffany lamp is going to come up and you're going to explode it and all this stuff it's like you're trying to get into a space as an actor like i don't even know what it is that i'm doing i'm going to give it my best shot so around that same time in 2006 i get this really strange audition from my agent for something called project b that's all it said on the script. And there was a description in there saying that this was going to be for a character called the Protector. And the Protector was going to be protecting something called the Gatherer Girls. And they said the Protectors are the last shred of humanity in this game. You know, they're, they have these deep voices. They're somewhat melodic. It might remind you of a whale song. But they have these sad, painful, sort of mournful <laughs> Uh, voices and um, they protect the gatherers and um, from both the player and they said the other monsters in the game and unlike any other video sort of game that was uh, going on at the time you know audition wise there was no picture there was no character drawing at all nothing it was just like leave that completely up to the actor's imagination and then they had like four different emotions that they wanted you to lay down so I had had some, you know, I grew up watching monster movies from the 1950s and things like that. So I'd always been playing around with some weird noises and th things like that. And there was one in particular that I had that I never really found a place for before. It was a couple different sounds. And I thought, you yeah, know, this seems like a good a place as any to try this out because I don't, I don't know what this is. Yeah, exactly. And so um, I laid down some... Um, some of those noises, which I'm sure everyone here will recognize as things that sound like, mm, mm, mm. you know, those kinds of 
moans and groans that we're all very familiar with that played the game. And about a month went by, I didn't hear anything, and then all of a sudden my agent called me back and said, uh, you booked this job. So um, uh, I think it was about sometime in April I went in and um, I was supposed to record the actual you know, uh, vocal tracks for the game. So I had to go to this place out in Encino, which is in the San Fernando Valley here in Los Angeles. It was a, um, a recording studio that had once been a very large private estate. It had uh, all these uh, like horse stables um, and not like old wooden stables or anything. There were these really like some wealthy person had built this thing with these horse stables, kind of a U-shaped uh, structure that had been turned into a sound uh, recording studio. It's all very mm -hmm. private behind gates. It's in a sort of a residential area, really. So I show up to this um, this recording session, and I go into the booth, and it's very dark in there. And the engineer is sitting in there by himself. And I said, "So, are we going to be joined by the, uh, you know, everyone from the gaming company at some point, or are they dialing in by ISDN or remotely?" And he says, "No." He goes, "It's just you and me. There's nobody here." To direct you or anything so i'm like okay he goes, so you, you kind of know what you're doing on this right because he goes all i have is this sheet of paper with all these uh different emotive states and i'm like well i'm just going to kind of expound on what i did for the audition so the engineer and i <laughs> did this whole thing by ourselves and kind of you know came up with um you know different varieties of things to to lay down and i thought okay well that's that. Wonder. I have no idea other than now I knew that the, what the name of the game was on like my contract. It said it was Bioshock, but I had no idea about anything else other than that. And like a lot of projects that uh, voiceover actors in particular work on, especially in animation, um, you don't expect to hear about anything for a year, maybe longer. <laughs> um, so that was it. I kind of like put it in the back of my mind and we thought, well, when it's done, I'm, I'm sure I'll hear about it or maybe, you know, they'll send me a copy of the game or, or something. So a number of months go by. Uh, and in December of 2006, I got another call from my agent saying, they need you to go back in and do some more of those noises that you did. And I'm like, okay. And this time it was at a different studio down in uh, Santa Monica, which is right behind me. You see beautiful Santa Monica. Um, so I went down to this uh, this session and I walk into the room and quite the opposite from the first session. And the room is now filled with people, all from, I guess, the gaming company. It was just, I saw this place was like, oh my God, there's gotta be like a dozen people in here. And uh, it's very, a lot of chatter and motion and a lot of good energy in the room. A lot of stuff was going on. And uh, one woman pulled me aside and she said, you know, we wanna show you a little bit of what it is that you've been making the noises for. And I remember she uh, she had like a little white uh, eye book. Those were kind of new at the time. And uh, she opened it up and opened up a QuickTime video. And I remember seeing this underwater scene. And then I saw the first images of the Big Daddy. And my eyes about popped out of my head. I think my jaw dropped to the floor. Because I'm a big fan of like the sort of that Art Deco, uh, streamlined, modern, um, steampunk, whatever you want to call it, that sort of the kind of put together and I had never seen a video game that had looked anything like that before. So I'm getting ready to go into the booth and now I'm kind of really kind of stunned at what, what I had just seen. I thought, wow, this is really something different from whatever I've seen so far, either played as, you know, as a, you know, as a gamer or, um, or worked on as an actor. So then I went into the booth and I believe Ken Levine and a, a lot of other people that were working on the game were in there. And uh, they kind of directed me. They wanted to have even more different emotive states for the character, like when he gets enraged, when he's dying, uh, things that just hadn't been covered. Mm -hmm. And they were all saying, like, where, where, where do you get these noises from? Where, where did that come from? And kind of told them pretty much the same thing that I told you. That's something that, you know, I've worked on since I was a kid and just really never found a place for. So once we were done with that, then it was just a matter of waiting for the game to come out. And uh, of course, when it came out, I was completely blown away. There's, there's, in the gaming, it's really weird, especially in, in voiceover. A lot of times you're working on games and because it's so solitary, you have no idea that some of your friends, people that you know are actually working on it. Um, 
in the original Bioshock, Nika Futterman, who played Asajj Ventress on the Clone Wars, worked with her a number of times. She was one of the original splicers that comes to get you, and, uh, you know, just breaking into the, the bathosphere. Uh, Armin Shimmerman, who played uh, Quark on DS9, of yep. course, you know, is wonderful as Andrew Ryan. And uh, so it was, it was really, really wonderful seeing the game, actually playing it, and then hearing all these voices of other people that I knew that were involved with it. And then, of course, I recorded such a vast library of sounds for the, the Big Daddy characters that you ended up using them all in the subsequent games, you know, all the way through to the, to the very end. Or to where we are right now, I should say. <laughs> Can never say never, I suppose, right? Right, uh-huh. <laughs> Um, so initially when you took the job, you see that it's got this, you know, code name. You have no idea what it is going into it. You eventually find out it's Bioshock. Did you ever think that the character that you played would become like essentially the poster child for the entire series along with like the little sister, arguably? No, not really. I mean, there's a lot of great, you know, interesting design characters and in games, you know, for all over the place so it's always kind of a crapshoot to think which one is going to be the breakout character that people really stick with i mean i liked it you know because of two reasons one i got to do the voice for it but also i liked the visual aesthetic of the character i love the design it looked like a, you know the diving helmet kind of thing it was just something that you know as a kid you know i used to have like gi joe in a diving suit you know and then vent the gi joe adventure team so i was really into that and i grew up in florida and you would see sponge divers and stuff wearing those big brass helmets and you know that kind of gear so that was kind of like in already ingrained into my uh, into my memory but i had no idea it was going to become so popular i mean i've been to comic conventions and stuff and seen you know, people, little girls dressed as little sisters and people dressed as big daddies. It's just phenomenal. And like, how is being a part of the series kind of like either benefited you in like obviously a positive way or just in general? Like, do you get a lot of people that come up to you that know you more based on your work on the Bioshock series or more on like the Star Wars side of stuff? Because I imagine it would be more on the Star Wars side of stuff. Yeah, I think people primarily know me from from Star Wars, from doing you know characters like uh, Ben Kenobi and Star Wars Rebels or uh, Grand Moff Tarkin and the Clone Wars, and you know I've been fortunate enough to uh, do a character for one of the um, the Star Wars films, Rogue One. I played a character called Admiral Raddus in that, and, that. and I've been in pretty much all the Star Wars animated series that they you know they've done up to date. So vast majority of people know me for that bioshock it's usually kind of something that people find out about either by looking on imdb or just have getting in a conversation about it with me because it doesn't really have any dialogue so a lot of people just assume that it's just a sound effect um you know a number of people that i've met over the years never equated that there was an actual person behind the character doing those vocalizations so it's always it's always interesting to watch their face when they find out that there's a an actual person uh, behind them. I mean, yeah, that would definitely kind of take you back, exp uh, like especially if you're playing the game and you're just hearing, like you said, the whale murmurs or just like these grunts and stuff like that. I wouldn't imagine somebody actually being behind a microphone recording those either. So definitely kind of takes you for a spin. Absolutely. Now, you said you've obviously played it through all three games, including, you know, 1, 2, and Infinite's DLC, correct? Yeah, they used every, every time I've seen the Big Daddy on screen, it's always been uh, stuff that I've, uh, that I've vocalized. I know that they, I think it was in Minerva's Den, I think they started to use some stuff that they hadn't used before, and that's when I believe you're having, like, it's the big end boss fight when you're fighting the multiple... Uh, alpha mm -hmm. uh you know the sort of screaming and stuff when they're on fire and all that, that was a, a lot of stuff that i had recorded that they really hadn't utilized up to that uh, much up to that point where it's really chaotic sounding and you know you can tell that the the character is in a lot of pain i think i heard more of that in nervous den than i heard anywhere else what was your favorite experience of all three like <laughs> just as a fan like sitting there and actually playing it would it be like the first one where you're like, oh my God, that's me. 
is it kind of like that or is it kind of wear off after you've done it for you know so long of a time if that makes sense yeah the first one is always the one that makes the biggest impression at least on me i mean because it's just so different and seeing what rapture what they had designed with that and then the gameplay and the mechanics you know of the uh the gameplay engine which i guess is unreal i don't know which version they were using in in that uh, in the first one but um you know it's just it was you had to play it to me it was like it brought me back to like one of the first games that i played uh not one of the first but i remember a game that really kind of sucked me in was mist i don't know if you remember mist and ribbon i don't know if you ever played those games they I were don't uh, believe so yeah they were cd rom uh at least the first one was a cd rom game and it mist came in a box that came with like a cd rom and an envelope with three clues in it and no instructions and uh the old idea is to stick the thing in there and all of a sudden you found yourself on this sort of like island someplace and you really had to play the game as if you were in the physical space you had to like if you walk past something turn around and look because there might be something behind a rock that you didn't see coming forward you know and i and i thought bioshock was very much like that if you didn't if you weren't aware of your surroundings if you didn't look everywhere into every nook and cranny and uh, corner you missed really important things you know whether it's the audio diaries or some some cash that you could use food ammo whatever it is you know it was one of those places where one of those games where you really had to put yourself in the space so you know the first one was great i loved in bioshock 2 i really enjoyed uh the uh the eleanor land uh story and uh i thought the uh, the emotional bond between subject delta her was really well done i love the whole at the end towards the end when you get the plasmid that's uh, bring your daughter to work day yeah that thing I, is so yeah. good you know it was like this is and you know it's just she was a wonderful character and once again you know i know there's controversy about this but the whole idea of making choices and then having the outcome of the game change based on those choices i thought was really really unique especially in, in bioshock 2 when you can really go down a very dark road and you influence her and then she goes down that road with you thinking well this is this is what you know you're teaching her morals <laughs> but if you're very in this very dark place she picks up the wrong message so you know i, I loved uh, you know a lot of the things about bioshock too the fact that they uh, they brought the train back i think that was had been excised from the original one and in favor of uh, the bathosphere the atlantic express i believe yeah right mm -hmm. so that was that was it was nice it was different and then Minerva's Den was just a, uh, what a wonderful surprise that was in so many ways. I mean, the, the gameplay, the characters, um, the ending of that, you know, that was just, I think that's one of the, one of the best DLCs I'd seen in a, in a long time. And then if you really want to talk about the DLCs, the, uh, for Bioshock Infinite, uh, Burial at Sea blew my socks off because I was not expecting I'm sitting there playing it. I did not expect to go back to Rapture from before the Civil War and all that and see it in its its heyday. And it was beautifully done. I was working with uh, 2K on their Mafia uh, remaster they were doing. And I was working with uh, my director, Nicole. She was uh, she directed the actors on uh, Bioshock Infinite. And I was saying, like, oh, my God, you guys did such an amazing job with that. And the genius of allowing the the uh, the player to actually play as Elizabeth in Burial at Sea Part Two, I thought was a, a wonderful uh, choice that they allowed you to make because I thought that version of Elizabeth uh, from that time period or that reality was just a great character. And plus, it was a huge like switch up too in characters. You go from playing this like brute of a man in Booker, and then all of a sudden mm -hmm. playing as Elizabeth, where you have to be more stealthy and more tactical. I thought right. that was very well done. And yeah, no, very well thought out. I mean, it's it's hard for me to wrap my head around the whole alternate reality thing. A lot of it stuff I just kind of let slide, and I just have fun with the game. But uh, you know, they did a they did a great job. Um, you know, melding the two. That especially, at, I think it's at Burial Sea Part Two. Is it the one where you go to Columbia and Rapture both? Yeah, and, basically, uh, you know, it like bleeds into the original Bioshock. So yeah. it's like, yeah, that starts the events of the first game, and then it kind of, like, loops back over. I can't think of anything more fun than that. I mean, that was just the, the only thing that I could say that 
my only cri- critique of that is like it needed to be longer. <laughs> it was too short. I wish for uh, episode one we could have explored more of Rapture. Like, I know a lot of fans have wanted that ever since, obviously, playing the first game. And mm-hmm. I feel Irrational gave back a little bit in episode one. But they could have just done a little bit more, in my opinion, just to see the actual scope of this huge underwater city before the whole Civil War took it down and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, I, I noticed that, uh, I, yeah, everyone wants to explore it more. I noticed that uh, there's a mod now for Half-Life where you, it's a VR mod where mm-hmm. you can actually explore Rapture on, you know, I think it's, I don't know how many years after, I don't know what the backstory is, but I think it's Patreon 8 or whatever. Uh, I don't know what, I'm getting the name wrong of the uh, of the company that's um, that put that uh, that mod together. But I've seen the screenshots from it and uh, it's beautifully done, you know. It, the more stuff that I see in um, in Rapture that's being done remastered at higher resolutions, and, you know, it's just uh, you just want you just really it's one of those places where you just want to explore it, you know, just for the, the sake of exploring. Yeah, I definitely would if I could. I mean, that would be one hell of a trip. I'll say that. Um. So other than that, like, it's still just hard to kind of wrap my head around it because obviously not a voice actor and all that it, I would still imagine it's extremely difficult even though you were playing around with these like noises and all these different techniques and stuff like that and you applied those to the big daddy I would still have that mindset of okay I've got these lines I have to do for this audition don't know what it is you go in there and they're like yeah just make noise like how do you translate that from going from like actor mode all of a sudden completely like into a new element if that makes any sense well voice <clears throat> actors run into this a lot where you get limited especially nowadays because there's everything is you know all all the uh all the ips have you know ndas on it on everything so you get sometimes very little information you know sometimes it depends on the project you'll sometimes you'll get a lot you'll get uh, breakdowns and a synopsis and drawings of the character otherwise and other times it's just pretty much like the script that I got for Bioshock. But you always have to approach it. I mean, if you're doing noises, you know, they just don't want random noises. They they had different emotive states, like I said, that they wanted uh, represented in each one of the different growls and moans and, and so on. So you just have to kind of think, all right, what what would I do? Like if if this were an on camera job, you know, how would I portray this or how how would you how would you how would you do it? You know, you just have to just imagine it you got to use your own imagination and kind of put that in gear and fill in the blanks. And hopefully, you know, you're, you're uh, in alignment with what the director or the creator or the writer, you know, what they're hearing or in their heads, you know, what they see, you know, and um, whether you, cause you have, there's, you have just, just have no idea. It's, there's a, there's a saying that they have, you know, uh, in auditioning, they'll, they'll know it when they hear it. <laughs> They'll know which is the right actor, you know, when they hear it, because it's it's a very ethereal thing sometimes trying to match up, you know, the uh, the performance to either the animation character or the um, or the game character. You know, Bioshock was it was unique in the sense that it it uh, you know even the the splicers all had personalities and things that were very identifiable. You know, all the different lines of dialogue that they say. You know, that's one of the big, they're not like just um, nameless, faceless uh, enemies that are just shooting at you from, you know, over the hill or something. They all have very distinct personalities. And, you know, you hear some of those lines in repetition, and you know, who's coming after you and what their abilities might be. Um, so, you know, it was, there was a lot of things that were just different about, about that game. It's once, once you've played it, it really is, you know, it's, it's easy to see why people have hung on to it for so long. You know, I was, uh, back in 2009, I got called in to meet with Gore Verbinski uh, at his uh, uh, studios that he had in Universal Studios on the lot, his production offices there, when they were doing the um, the Bioshock movie was in production. And um, I had a couple of pages of dialogue. I was not going in there as the big daddy. I, I, was, I was doing something completely different. It had to do with uh, kind of like almost like a, I think they were creating a, a promo teaser film, you know, kind of like 
kind of like a trailer, but maybe like a sizzle reel. I'm not really sure. I don't want to say too much about it, only because I don't know if any of that stuff is going to be ported over into what they're doing over with the, the Netflix version. But I remember walking into the production offices and was absolutely amazed because in the in the lobby area, which was kind of had this open air, almost like an atrium kind of thing, they had like this two story tall big daddy like cutout in the uh, in the waiting area, and um, you know I remember telling. Uh, Gore and some of the people in there and I said actually I said you know that character out in the lobby is who I play in the game and they were like what you 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 play that character like they weren't even sure like how how what I went what I meant with I did I do mocap did I do voice and so on so but um yeah I mean uh, just being in that room was like an overload of uh, information because they had drawings and paintings and concept art and all kinds of things it's uh it's too bad that it didn't go through, but you know, better to have it go through the way the director wants it to, his what what his vision is, rather than it being a watered down version or something. Because, you know, the the horror sort of aspect of Rapture and Bioshock is really critical to to what makes that game what it is. Especially like with the atmosphere as well. It's mm-hmm. kind of a shame that they like can the whole project though until recently, where uh, Netflix and Two K kind of like mutually agreed. Uh, because I imagine like Bioshock without that R rating, I know Universal I believe wanted it PG thirteen. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think it would have sat well with the majority of like the fans, even like the voice actors or the developers that worked on the actual game. So, I just wonder what would have happened. It's kind of like one of those what ifs. Yeah. Well. I don't know that we'll ever know completely what that answer is, but uh, I'm looking forward to see what uh, Netflix does with it. And uh, I've never read the book. I know there's a novelization of uh, a Bioshock or Rapture. I'm not sure what it's what yeah. it's called. I've Rapture seen by John Shirley. Mm-hmm. I've never read that, but uh, I heard a lot of people talk about it and say that they they really enjoyed it. So I would definitely recommend it. To that in there. Yeah, I would definitely recommend it. It takes like place way or not way before but a little bit before the construction of rapture and Mm -hmm. it like builds up all these characters it builds up like andrew ryan beforehand it builds up fontaine and all these characters are introduced with more depth so that just adds to the overall experience as well when you play the game too it's pretty cool speaking of frank fontaine uh that just reminds me so i'm I, I go back a little ways more than probably some do so frank fontaine is actually the name of an actor who was uh, well known for doing uh, uh, some animation voices. In fact, there's a character that I do for Looney Tunes called Pete Puma. I don't know if you're familiar with this character at all. You know, he kind of sound like this. You know, you want one lump or two or three. He's Bugs Bunny, as you know, he's, he's always banging him on the head with a hammer. Well, Pete Puma is modeled after uh, a character that Frank Fontaine uh, made up called. Uh, either Crazy Guggenheim on the Jackie Gleason show or uh, John Savoni on the Jack Benny radio program. So given the fact that Bioshock takes place back in the, you know that time period, I have a feeling that somebody there, either Ken Levine or somebody was a fan, and they lifted that name, Frank Fontaine, and, and put that in there as a, as a character. Because when I first saw that, the first thing I thought about is like, Frank Fontaine, you're talking about a guy that sounds like Pete Puma is going to be in, uh, in this... Uh, in this game it's kind of weird now that you mentioned that i'd never even thought about that before i didn't know about that that's it really interesting yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i'm sure there's all kinds of easter eggs in uh in the game like that that you know you really got to be uh steeped in pop culture that goes way back in order to catch the references and then not to mention like the music too, the music and everything that comes with it just kind of sets the mood for like the entirety of rapture. So whoever did that, like kudos to them. Yeah. I think that's one of the main, uh, that's, I don't want to say a main, but that the, the sound design in the, in the whole, uh, the whole, uh, the whole game series is phenomenal. You know, the, the, I'm not sure exactly who was responsible with the, who all was all in their team, but everything from the ambient sound of, Thanks to the mixing of the sounds of the Big Daddy and uh, the music, all of it uh, meshes together so well. It's kind of, uh, it's so immersive. It makes you really feel like, like you're there in that time period. 
Yeah, I would definitely say so. Um, other than that, I think that might be all that I have on my mind. That's like I wanted to get into the perspective of what it was like kind of behind the mask, if that makes sense, and like the thought process going into being a big daddy. So I guess my final question is, uh, which was your favorite model of Big Daddy, if you remember them? Like, which one did you love to see on the screen at all times? Well, let's see. Is it the, uh, is it, well, I know there's the, there's the Bouncer, the Rosie, the, let me see if I can get them all, the Alpha, the Lancer. Um, am I missing any? Uh, one? The Rumbler as well. The Rumbler, yeah. I would say the Rumbler is probably, well, I don't know. I, I, I think the, what's the one with the drill on the hand? Is that the Bouncer? I, or the Rosie? But it's one of them. I get them confused a lot as well because all I see <laughs> you're the expert. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to you. I'm trying to remember. I, I know it's but one the, of them for sure. The iconic one with the drill on its hand, you know, is, is definitely I think you know my favorite to, to see on screen. You know, and then for me personally, I like the Lancers just because I feel like they're the most unique looking out of like the entire group. So yeah. And I still haven't gotten good at turning my head away before they fire that <laughs> blinding laser light. It gets me every time. And it's just a force of habit. You kind of mm -hmm. just have to like flip around. It'll be all right. <laughs> but all right. Well, yeah, I'm still working. I'm still playing it on an Xbox 360. So you know, I'm a little little behind. Yeah, that's okay. Maybe we can hook you up with the console here shortly. Or <laughs> PC. So yeah. That, that actually, by the way, I was going to say I did. I have had a chance to play the multiplayer a few times on Xbox 360. It's been a long time since I did it, but uh, of course, and I don't really play multiplayers because I'm not nearly as good as anybody that uh, plays games on a regular basis. It's more of a chance for me to go in and look around and see what I can see before I get shot into a million pieces and have to respawn. How did you enjoy it, by the way? I, I liked it from what little I played with it. I've only played like a handful of matches. It was really difficult to find any matches online on, on Xbox. And I've done a few private matches with friends, you know, just to kind of play around with it. But uh, I thought it was, I thought it was a lot of fun. You know, it's, uh, it's one of those things that I wasn't expecting. And I, I did, really didn't know how, how to play it at, at the beginning. I'm like, well, what is, what is this? What's going on here? Took me, uh, you know, a while to kind of like uh, figure my way around, but once I did, I thought, "Oh, this is this is fun." I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that's still out there too. Yeah, definitely. I'd I'd love to see like some sort of either multiplayer or co-op come into the next Bioshock as well. I just think mm -hmm. it'd be cool to be able to play with more people as well as just play with like a friend or two and go throughout the entire story, especially with like right. all the rumors of the game and stuff like that. Um, other than that, is there anything that you would like to say before we go? Is there anything that you'd like to plug, like your social medias, upcoming projects, anything like that? Time is all yours. Uh, sure. Well, if anyone wants to find me on, uh, you know, I'm on the usual social media sites on Twitter at uh, Stephen underscore Stanton on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, uh, Stephen Stanton one, and I have uh, Facebook as as well. And um, YouTube channel if you want to see uh, some clips of some of the things that I've worked on there some of the trailers and clips from uh, the Star Wars projects I've got uh, videos there for people to see um, right now as far as like what's on what's on television that you know people could be watch if you have Disney plus we have uh, monsters at work and Star Wars the Bad Batch um, you know that's uh, that's that's playing and I did an episode of the uh, the book of boba fett so if you're a star wars fan there's a uh content out there for you to watch and uh and then of course you know fire up bioshock and play that there you go always a nice little self promo <laughs> but anyways thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this interview i really do appreciate it and i'm sure the fans will appreciate that as well well thanks a lot eric it was great talking to you likewise and thank you all for watching with that being said Take care, stay safe, and talk to you all in the next one. See ya.